Welcome everyone to this Centre for Resources, Energy and Environmental Law Annual Lecture. Before the lecture formally begins, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters on which the law school is situated and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Noting that the scholarship uh, from Creel has engaged very directly in questions related to uh, many aspects of Indigenous life. And uh, I am introducing someone who really needs no introduction, but I'd like to take this also as an acknowledgement of the contribution that Emeritus Professor Michael Cromlin, AO, had made not just to scholarship uh, within the law school generally, but particularly to the centre. And so it is with great pleasure that um, we have Michael delivering today the lecture Resources Law and Public Policy Revisited. And I was reflecting on this point that questions, issues that Michael engaged with around royalty, liberalism, issues that are now to the forefront in a slightly different context around energy and will there be market intervention? What is the appropriate uh, position to be taken on questions around gas royalties, around whether um, we should have a gas reserve? So these are perennial questions that Michael has engaged with and he has eminent standing in this field. So if you'll just let me repeat some of the things that were given in the introduction to this lecture. So Emeritus Professor Michael Cromlin was the Zelman Cowan Professor of Law in Melbourne Law School at the University of Melbourne. And he continues, of course, to be that Emeritus Professor. And he was Dean of the Melbourne Law School from 1989 to 2002, from 2003 to 2007. And we liked him so much, we asked him to come back again in 2010. So Michael's long service to the law school uh, is evident in that history. Michael holds degrees of uh, Bachelor of Arts and LLB Honor from the University of Queensland as well as an LLM and PhD from the University of British Columbia. And uh, again, the engagement between Creel and uh, uh, University of BC has been longstanding. And I think Michael has done a great deal of fostering those networks over time. Uh, throughout his distinguished career, he had several visiting academic appointments, including a visiting professor at the Peter A. Allard School of Law uh, at the University of British Columbia. Uh, Michael has also uh, very considerable professional legal networks. He was admitted as a lawyer in 1969. He has uh, been a member of the American Law Institute since 1998 and an elected fellow of the Academy of Law since 2010. He has served on various legal professional bodies, uh, including the Council of the Section on Energy and Resources Law of the International Bar Association. Um, I have special thanks to Michael, who introduced me to that wonderful group of scholars, and they have been a central part of my scholarship over some 15 years, and Michael is uh, certainly one of the most well-regarded of the group of Australian energy and resources and uh, lawyers within that distinguished um, international group. And I think we're um, <clears throat> some 25 members at the moment, um, including a very recent uh, addition from um, Michael from the, uni uh, the um, City University of Hong Kong, who is a PhD graduate from uh, Creel. So the links with that group that you, you fostered are, are longstanding. Um, and also in relation to professional associations, uh, Michael was a foundation member of AMPLA, a not-for-profit uh, professional organization for energy and resources um, uh, lawyers, president, and now a life member. And uh, 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 his 
distinguished career was also recognized by being appointed an officer in the general division of the order of australia for service to law and legal education and most importantly of all michael amongst those many honors and awards uh, <clears throat> michael uh, was also a foundational uh, or foundational to the establishment of creel itself at that point it was the center for resources and uh, energy law um, and I think Jackie and I had the temerity to actually add the environment along the way. So <laughs> um, that's how we get this current name. So um, uh, Michael had been a source of great inspiration and assistance and also has acted as director um, more recently of that centre. Um, so to all the distinguished scholars out there, the people on the web, including uh, the Dean of the Law School, Professor Matthew Harding, could I now turn over to Michael to give us the annual lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, and uh, particularly for that very generous introduction. Um, I too would like to pay my respects to the traditional life the land on which we meet. Um, thanks for this invitation, and uh, it's an opportunity that I very much appreciate. I regret, though, that I must uh, start on uh, a sad note. Um, Sandy Clark, who was um, a colleague, um, a uh, co-founder, of this centre uh, and uh, uh, a remarkable contributor to the development of natural resources law in this country, especially with respect to water, but uh, not by any means confined to that. And indeed, uh, a renowned figure in this field overseas died last night. I, uh, I only, <clears throat> sorry, I only uh, heard the news this morning. He was a close friend. Now, to the business, and uh, I apologize for such a gloomy introduction, and I hope things will pick up from here. <laughs> um, in 1983, I read a paper called Resources Law and Public Policy, which identified the constitutional and legal foundation of management of natural resources in Australia. Today, I propose to revisit that subject as a benefit for decades of hindsight. Melbourne Cup Week provides a great opportunity to set up a few of my hobby horses, and five in particular I wish to address today. One, colonisation, then self-government, federation, property, and private engagement. Starting with colonisation, in this part I consider sovereignty, native title, and reception of English law. All, of course, the ruthless brevity, for which I probably should apologise, at the outset. All of these matters present continuing interest uh, issues for the management of natural resources, and hence my attention to them today. Sovereignty vested initial control of what were then called the wastelands of the Crown in the British government. It was widely presumed that the rights of Indigenous, the indigenous occupants were thereby extinguished. However, of course, in the Mabo case, the High Court decided that acquisition of sovereignty by the Crown over Australian territory merely conferred radical title to land rather than beneficial ownership of land. This was a critical step in the reasoning of the Court for Recognition of Native Title. In that case, the Court also encountered the contentious issue that I want to say something about today, namely that of extinguishment of native title. The plaintiffs in Mabo apparently conceded that the Crown had the power to extinguish native title by clear and, and plain legislation. But lurking in the background was the more difficult issue of whether the Crown had executive power. 
to extinguish native title. The court was not required to determine the issue on this occasion. But four years later, the court returned to the matter in weak peoples. Even though, as Justice Gummo then observed, the fundamental issue in that case was the impact upon native title of statute and of sui generis interests created under statute. Justice Gummo went on uh, to say that the Crown's radical title to public lands enabled the Crown to grant interest in land and become absolute beneficial owner of un un unalienated land. But, and this is crucial, the quote, these prerogatives of the Crown, he said, were displaced by the constitutional settlement of the mid 19th century, which I'll return. Thereafter, he said, all land in Queensland was to be dealt with pursuant by statute. And of course, by that he meant only by statute. But in that same case with people's Chief Justice Brennan thought otherwise. In his opinion, the Crown's exercise of sovereign power to use unalienated land for its own purposes um, extinguishes um, partially or wholly native title interests in or over the land used. So the matter was left unresolved and it remains so. Its significance, of course, has been diminished by the passage of the Native Title Act of 1993, the Commonwealth Act, but uh, it still, as I said before, lurks in the background and could. Um, become significant in relation to early extinguishment. Sovereignty led naturally to the reception of English law in the Australian colonies. And in 1828, the United Kingdom Parliament confirmed the reception of English laws and statutes, as it described them, in the colonies of New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land as far and this is important language, as far as the same can be applied within the said colonies. Unquote. That qualification provoked contentious issues then, especially in relation to public land and resources. Today, it's difficult to comprehend how the courts then and later could proffer and sustain the entirely implausible fiction that English land law derived largely from a feudal era in English history was applicable in colonial Australia in the 19th century. To quote Justice Gordon in the Wood People's case, its artificial requirements and distinctions were hardly necessary or convenient. Probably too late to redress that egregious error of judgment. Still, it may well provide some explanation for the radical transformation of Australian land law by the colonial legislatures upon achievement of self government. So now I turn to self government. I look at three major developments of enduring significance to the management of natural resources from the colonial era, second half of the 19th century, when the Australian colonies acquired self-government. The three issues to which I will um, speak are firstly, the struggle for control of the wastelands of the Crown. Secondly, the creation of statutory land titles. And thirdly, the reservation of natural resources from Crown land grants. It's interesting to observe, although it receives very little attention, that the control of the wastelands of the Crown was a very lively issue indeed in early Australian colonial history. We all know about the Eureka Stockade and uh, the rebellion which underpinned uh, that, but we know much less, or at least we speak much less, about the rebellion linked to self-government. 
Initially, of course, British government exercised complete control of the wastelands of the Crown through the exercise of prerogative power, uh, usually delegated to its local agents, the colonial governors. But in 1842, the United Kingdom Parliament uh, passed an act uh, for regulating the sale of wasteland belonging to the Crown and the Australian colonies, as it was called. And in that act, uh, it declared, and I quote, that within the Australian colonies, the wastelands of the Crown shall be disposed of in the manner and then according to the regulations hereinafter prescribed, and then comes the key words, and not otherwise. In other words, the further future disposal of the wastelands of the Crown would occur only under statutory authority. Um, these, or more technically, these last words clearly abridged uh, or abrogated, perhaps the, the better word than abridged, the prerogative of the Crown to dispose of public land and resources in the Australian colonies, a major development. But major as it was, it was not enough for the colonists of the time who were not satisfied with that shift from executive power to uh, British legislative uh, authority. Self-government appeared to offer an opportunity to gain local control over the wastelands of the Crown. In 1850, the United Kingdom Parliament passed an act which authorised the establishment of legislative councils in each of the Australian colonies and conferred power on all of these councils to create new legislatures. This act did not, and quite clearly did not, allow these new legislatures to upset the fairly recently established arrangements for disposal of the wastelands of the Crown pursuant to the Act of the United Kingdom Parliament in 1842. But undeterred, New South Wales and Victoria prepared constitution bills purporting to confer power on their new legislatures to make laws relating to the disposal of public land and resources. These uh, um, bills needed ratification by the United Kingdom Parliament, and one might have expected that it was unlikely to be given. But again, another surprise, the United Kingdom Parliament acquiesced in these rebellious actions by enacting both the New South Wales Constitution Statute of 1855 and the Victorian Constitution Statute of 1855, each of which appended and ratified a new colonial constitution, which transferred control of public land resources to its new colonial legislature. It did so via two distinct provisions. One was a section in the ratifying act itself, the act of the United Kingdom Parliament, that declared, quote, the entire management and control of the wastelands of the Crown uh, in the colony and the proceeds thereof, including all royalties, mines and minerals, shall be vested in the legislature of the colony. I dwell on the text of this provision, the entire management and control of the wastelands of the Crown a ringing declaration that went well beyond mere disposal of public land and resources to confer complete control of public land and resources in each of the colonies upon its newly established representative legislature. The other provision was a section in each of the constitutions, which, as I said, were scheduled to the um, United Kingdom statutes, these provisions conferred power on the colonial legislature, not that one or thought it would be particularly necessary, but nothing was being left to doubt, to make laws for regulating the sale, letting, disposal, and occupation of the wastelands of the Crown within the said colony and of all mines and minerals therein. At the same time, the United Kingdom Parliament repealed its 1842 Act, 
conferred powers on the new legislature of Tasmania and South Australia to regulate the sale and other disposal of the waste lands of the Crown within their jurisdiction and authorised the Queen to regulate these matters in Western Australia until the Parliament uh, uh, completed the process of um, uh, conferring self-government on that colony. Following separation from New South Wales in 1859, Queensland adopted its own constitution, which vested again, I quote the language, the entire management and control of the wastelands belonging to the Crown in the local legislature. When Western Australia did acquire self-government belatedly in 1890, um, the, its uh, constitution or the United Kingdom Act which authorised its constitution included a similar provision. So the outcome of this dramatic saga is a foundational principle of state constitutional law. Legislation is essential to the management and control of the public lands and natural resources in the Australian states. Non-statutory executive power over public lands and resources no longer exists. Uh, for good measure, this principle has received unequivocal judicial recognition. The recognition. Two cases stand out. Uh, the earlier case, Cudgeon Rutile number two against Chalk, decided in 1974, concerned an alleged contract between two mining companies in the state of Queensland arising from the grant by the minister to companies under the relevant legislation in that state, the Mining Acts of 1898 to 1955. The grants were of authorities to prospect for minerals and the companies uh, upon discovery of minerals uh, then applied uh, for the further grant of special mining leases under the Act authorising production of the um, minerals that they had uh, found within the authority areas. The critical question was whether there was any power, statutory or non-statutory, conferred on the minister uh, or the governor and council for that matter to enter into a contract binding the state to grant special mining leases to the companies? Uh, the answer to that question uh, was determined by statutory interpretation. A paragraph in the advice of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, this was one of the um, um, last cases to um, go before that body on appeal from Australia. Uh, is worthy of um, a quotation. Uh, let me quote. As a starting point, their lordships accept as fully established the proposition that in Queensland, as in other states of the Commonwealth of Australia, the Crown cannot contract for the disposal of any interest in Crown lands unless under and in accordance with power to that effect conferred by statute. In Queensland, the legal basis for this power and for the limitations upon it is to be found in the Constitution Act of 1867, of which Section 30 provides for the making of laws regulating the sale, letting, disposal, and occupation of the wastelands of the Crown, and Section 40 vests the management and control of the wastelands of the Crown in the legislature. The result in the case, given that uh, starting point, that proposition uh, confirmed by the Judicial Committee of the Privy, Case, the Privy Council, um, followed naturally the Mining Acts, um, conferred power to grant special mining leases not on the Minister, uh, but on the Governor and Council, and furthermore prescribed various statutory requirements that had to be met before that power could lawfully be exercised. Clearly, uh, the minister had no statutory power to preempt those provisions by contract, which was the argument the companies um, put to the courts, nor any non statutory executive power to do so. The second case is a much more recent case, the decision of the High Court 
in 2017 in Forest and Forest Proprietary Limited against Wilson, the uh, uh, ever um, uh, active uh, Twiggy Forest, in this case, um, was a party, not as a miner, but as a pastoralist who was seeking to prevent mining activities on impassable property. Um, um, the case was in many respects similar to Cogent Rutile, concerned the power to grant mining leases under the Western Australian Act 1978, being the relevant legislation at that time. The question, and this was an important question because it had been the subject of vigorous debate in practice in the profession in Western Australia for decades beforehand, seemed to me astonishing that it could be a matter even of discussion, much less debate, given the authority in Cajun Rizal and Chalk, but nevertheless, it had been a matter of strong contest in Western Australia up until Forest and Forest. Um, the debate being framed, I think, in the wrong terms. Uh, the old adage, if you ask yourself the wrong question, you're unlikely to get the right answer. But the question then uh, discussed was whether uh, lawful grant of a statutory mining title required strict compliance with statutory requirements or merely substantial compliance with statutory requirements. There have been whole books written on that issue, despite another case, which we don't have time to mention, in which the High Court, it seemed to me, had decided. Um, in any event, uh, the um, High Court framed the question differently. And I think, with respect, correctly. They said the question was whether non-compliance not strict or substantial, simply non-compliance, the provisions of the Act prior to the grant of a mining lease would render invalid any leases that the minister purported to grant. Again, of course, the answer uh, was to be found in statutory interpretation. And the court uh, relied heavily on the relevant constitutional principle citing the Cajun Retail case. Again, I quote from the plurality judgment in Forest and Forest because I think the language is important. Um, their Honour said, when a statute that provides for the disposition of interest in the resources of a state prescribes a mode of exercise of the statutory power, that mode must be followed and observed. The statutory conditions regulating the make, making of a grant must be observed. A grant will be effective if the regime is complied with, but not otherwise. This approach to construction, I'm still quoting, this approach to statutory construction had its origin in colonial times in legislation which vested the disposition of land in the legislatures of the Australian colonies. Adherence to this approach supports parliamentary control of the disposition of lands held by the Crown in right of the states. In other words, compliance is the issue. What amounts to compliance is decided as a exercise of statutory interpretation and non-compliance is fatal to the exercise of the power. Uh, that's what the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council appeared to have decided in Cajun Rutile um, more than 40 years earlier, but um, I just simply Note in passing that there is a case that's been commenced in the Supreme Court of Western Australia uh, that is now on appeal before the Court of Appeal in that state, which attempts again to resuscitate substantial compliance as sufficient to authorize the lawful exercise of statutory power. Sorry. That my assistant.
In my view, this part of the decision leaves no room for doubt about the abrogation of non statutory executive power. And a corollary of that is that compliance, whatever the parliament chooses to prescribe in that respect, is essential um, before a grant of power can be lawfully exercised. I turn now to the second development, development of revolutionary import, in my view, the displacement of freehold by statutory titles, freehold title to land uh, by statutory titles in Australia. Again, a very significant colonial development. Prior to self-government, of course, the United Kingdom granted land to colonial settlers, usually in the form of freehold title. In accordance with applicable English land law, freehold title conferred rights to exclusive possession not only to the surface, but also to the subsurface of the airspace above the surface of land. Uh, many of you will have been exposed to the Latin uh, presumption, cuius et solemnes et ultra et calum et ad infra, if you find it helpful. <laughs> I don't. However, this dependence on freehold title by um, the colonizing power was broken after self government. Instead, the coloni colonies exercised their newly won control of public lands to create statutory land titles. Unfortunately, and this really is regrettable, often called leases or licenses, but usually very different in legal character from their English namesakes. So we have this really unsatisfactory situation which English legal nomenclature has been adopted for creatures that are quite different to their English namesakes. The rights conferred and obligations imposed by these um, titles, statutory titles, were specified in the relevant statute, of course, giving rise to, in the view of uh, a scholar who did very valuable work on this subject uh, many years ago, uh, Dr. Fry, um, a bewildering multiplicity of tenures. Dr. Fry's work is quoted extensively in the weak people's case. Um, these, this mul bewildering multiplicity of tenures were similar to one another only in their legislative origin and in their creation of a legal relationship between the granting polity, the relevant state, and the holder of each title. Um, notwithstanding their diversity, however, these statutory titles are readily distinguishable from freehold titles. They might not be always easy to distinguish from one another, but they're distinguishable from freehold title. They confer limited rights of possession, often very limited rights of possession, although that's not a message the holder of these titles likes to receive. Uh, they also confer limited rights of occupation or utilization of the land, typically confined to narrowly specified activities and usually with no entitlement to subsurface geological formations or storage spaces within uh, the three-dimensional space of the land to which they apply. The Cuyus says solemn presumption, of course, has no application to them. Now, the point of my drawing this distinction is that only 20% of Australian land is now held under freehold title, compared to more than 40% held under statutory tenures. The portion of land subject to freehold title ranges widely from 68% in Victoria, the greatest, uh, highest, to 8% in Western Australia. The rest, of course, is made up by reserves for public purposes of various courts, courses and special tenures distinct, I'm not now talking about native title, uh, but special statutory uh, tenures conferred on Aboriginal organisations by Commonwealth South Australian and Queensland legislation. So, um, the 
tendency to resort to English landlord to solve our legal problems when they arise is, uh, I think, open to real question when we recognise how little land in Australia is indeed uh, held under freehold or any other such uh, common law title. The last matter under this heading to which I want to refer um, is um, that in which the Australian colonies curtailed the application of English land law by limiting the rights of holders freehold title to this to exploit some surface resources. In other words, where there was freehold title, it didn't necessarily follow that the English rules applicable to freehold title were uh, adopted in the relevant Australian colonial jurisdiction. Uh, Take Victoria, for example. Uh, despite its relatively extensive grants of freehold title, at least compared to other states, Victoria uh, remained retained entitlement to most subsurface resources by imposing a depth limitation on all grants of freehold title made after on or after the 1st of March, 1892. A depth limitation of just over 15 metres. Now, uh, this is a really surprising uh, provision, one that is seldom if ever mentioned in practice. It's never been mentioned to me by a legal practitioner in Victoria. Ordinary holders of freehold title, as you know, um, people who have um, land within urban areas in Victoria, in the main, uh, tend to assume that they have rights extending to the centre of the earth, wherever that may be. But unless the initial crown grant of their land occurred before the 1st of March, 1892, they don't. And again, I'm sure many, when the time comes, will be distressed to make that discovery. Whether a similar, I have not been able to find a similar provision in any other state, but I confess that I certainly haven't done a recent search on that score. So I just put it to you as a question to think about. I suspect there aren't. I suspect this is something uniquely Victorian, but I don't know for sure. Furthermore, during the second half of the 19th century, all colonies adopted the really important practice of preservation of mineral and petroleum resources from subsequent grants of freehold title. Uh, many years later, uh, the Northern Territory, South Australia, New South Wales, and Victoria took the further step of compulsory acquisition of privately owned minerals in freehold titles that have been granted prior to the adoption of this reservation practice, thereby removing all residual private ownership of minerals within their jurisdictions. Um, so far as petroleum is concerned, all states without exception and the Northern Territory um, uh, assert property in all petroleum, regardless of its location, and some also declare property in geothermal energy resources. So the result is that most land-based natural resources in Australia are the property of the state or territory in which they naturally occur, regardless of the proprietorship of the land in which they're located. Unlike the situation in England and in uh, some other former English colonies. So that brings me to federation. Uh, and of course the federal union the Australian colonies in 1901 added a new dimension to the management of natural resources. Constitution conferred powers relating to natural resources on the Commonwealth Parliament, the Commonwealth Government, and the Commonwealth Courts, but it left undisturbed the colonial, which became state, proprietorship of natural resource, resources within state territorial boundaries. Um, Commonwealth legislative powers are limited by specification of subject matters, and few of them are conferred uh, exclusively on the Commonwealth Parliament. 
The result is, and this is my main point, that that legislative authority over natural resources is shared between the Commonwealth and the states, but it's shared in a particular way that reflects the mechanism employed in the Commonwealth Constitution for uh, conferral of power on the Commonwealth Parliament. Um, that mechanism involves essentially a subject list of Commonwealth powers, none of which, of course, actually mentions natural resources. But uh, among those subjects that are specified are things like uh, interstate and overseas trade and commerce, uh, corporations of various categories, defence, um, taxation, and uh, the people of any race who would still need, deem necessary to make special laws, external affairs, and so on. Now, that rather fragmentary nature of Commonwealth legislative powers has significance for the management of natural resources. Commonwealth powers, uh, conferred in that way, have a distinctly negative flavour. It's easier for the Commonwealth to curtail rather than promote the development of natural resources. And well, I shan't go into either of them, they're well known. Two cases, there are many uh, exemplify that. One, Murphy Oars Incorporated, uh, proprietary limited against the Commonwealth, commonly known as the Fraser Island case, and where the trade and commerce power was used to uh, prevent, uh, block a proposed uh, mining operation on Fraser Island in Queensland. And of course, the even better known case, the Tasmanian Dam case, in which uh, Commonwealth powers, notably, not only the external affairs power, were used to block the construction of um, hydroelectricity uh, facilities on the Gordon Bay Franklin River. Um, so, by and large, the states control the development of their natural resources. Offshore, beyond coastal waters, the Commonwealth uh, has control over seabed resources. Now, uh, I was going to say something about executive power, but I need to truncate those remarks. I wanted to um, um, draw attention to the well-known um, Trio of cases, Pape, uh, Williams number one and Williams number two, the two school chaplaincy cases, and the High Court's um, uh, uh, approach to uh, determining the scope of Commonwealth executive power that those cases exemplify. Um, the um, uh, last of the trio, Williams number two, I think is the most significant case because essentially it was a unanimous decision of the court and its language was very direct indeed. Um, so uh, the, in that uh, uh, case, uh, the uh, court um, cast doubt upon the utility of the British concept of prerogative power, which according to the court merely informs an inquiry of non-executive power in Australia, rather than determines uh, the scope of non-statutory uh, um, executive power. That, in my view, represents a shift, a significant shift. Uh, now, of course, it had not, none of those cases had anything to do with natural resources. They dealt with uh, as public spending and uh, um, government contracting. But the principle, the approach adopted to determining the scope and indeed the limitations on the scope of non-statutory executive uh, power of the Commonwealth are important. In contrast to that, there's a case which I shall merely mention, but not uh, developed, Johnson and Kent uh, of a different era, 1975. Those of you flying in that Canberra will know the telecommunications tower on Black Mountain, 
Johnson and Kent was an unsuccessful challenge to the uh, proposal to construct that tower. Uh, the basis of the challenge, which was unsuccessful then, but I really query the validity of that decision. Um, the, the, the basis of the challenge was that there was no legislative authorization for that project. Uh, it was fully undertaken as an exercise of non statutory, according to then Chief Justice Bowers, prerogative power over Crown lands. Uh, I just don't think that case uh, survives what's happened in the meantime. Uh, so um, let me uh, move on then to property. And there are four aspects of that that I want to mention briefly. They are state responsibility, constitutional protection, the royal metals and physical equalization. Um, the, um, it follows, I think, from what I've said already, that states have, through their proprietorship of natural resources, uh, responsibilities in relation to those resources. And one of those responsibilities is to uh, uh, collect what economists call rent, uh, widely known as economic rent, um, from the exploitation of those resources. Uh, we um, will, uh, in many cases, recall the ill-fated Minerals Resource Rent Tax Act, the Commonwealth Act of 2012, which attempted to muscle in on that exercise in an era like the one we currently uh, face uh, or are uh, involved in, of very high international prices for those resources. The challenge to that act, uh, the constitutional challenge was unsuccessful, uh, but the design of that resource rent tax was, I think, critical to the outcome of the case. Uh, the key point of the design of that tax was that state royalties were given a full credit against tax liability, MRIT liability. Uh, so that the Commonwealth tax did not kick in until after um, the, the, uh, those royalties had been collected by the states, along with, of course, uh, from the point of view of the companies, um, um, uh, the recovery of their uh, investments and a rate of return on their investments. That's the way rent taxation works. And um, of course, it's interesting to speculate about whether present circumstances may cause us to revisit uh, that. The PRRT uh, has been around a lot longer than the MRRT Act ever was. The PRRT is still in force and it goes back to um, 1987, Petroleum Resource Rent Tax Act. Uh, unfortunately, it suffered very damaging amendments at the time of the enactment of the Mineral Resource Rent Tax, for reasons never adequately explained, uh, so that its efficacy in collecting for the Commonwealth uh, some portion of economic rent uh, was um, seriously um, um, uh, impaired at that time. Uh, but again, we see from today's paper, the Commonwealth Treasurer appears to have the PRRT Act on his list of considerations for responses to very high international prices for um, liquefied natural gas. Um, I'll um, skip by Royal Metals uh, because uh, my remarks there um, really uh, so focus simply on uh, some comments that um, members of the court chose to make for reasons not apparent uh, about which level of government in Australia, Commonwealth or State, is entitled to the royal prerogative with respect to the Royal Metals. 
Uh, it's always been assumed, and it was indeed in that case. The state level of government uh, carries that entitlement, uh, inherited that element of the prerogative, uh, essentially on colonization. Uh, but members of the court wondered whether perhaps it might really rest with the Commonwealth, which uh, um, is um, an odd thing to do in the sense that the Commonwealth wasn't a party to the case. Um, but I just draw it to your attention. The last thing I want to say on property concerns fiscal equalization. And again, I just give you a conclusion here. Fiscal equalization is a topic that time doesn't allow um, proper treatment, um, but um, it is essentially the mechanism by which uh, the most of the proceeds of the Commonwealth um, Goods and Services Tax are carved up amongst the states. So apart from collection costs, which the Commonwealth obtains, um, the, rest of the main proceeds are divided up amongst the states, and the question is who gets what. And uh, really the issue there is, the issue that I uh, want to mention is how does, um, uh, how do uh, resource royalties collected by states fit there? It's clear what uh, they are treated for equalization purposes as if they are ordinary revenue. And my point, which is one I made back in 1983 originally and never got anywhere with then and seem unlikely to get anywhere with now, my point simply is that maybe they're not, maybe they shouldn't be treated. Uh, maybe royalties are different to ordinary. Uh, government revenues, which are essentially derived from taxation uh, uh, um, that is of a recurrent rather than ca uh, capital nature. Um, so uh, the last thing, again, which I just um, can only mention is what I call private engagement. Um, and um, and let me just make the point that I have in relation to that. The main point is that although, and I've spent a lot of time explaining how and why, uh, governments have proprietorship of most natural resources in Australia. Governments sell them, explore for them, or exploit them. Those activities are and have been. Uh, with some exceptions, um, largely been privatised. So there is a huge issue in how governments, through their statutory arrangements that are required, the reasons discussed, um, design those arrangements with the private sector. And my point about that is that um, although some of these arrangements have commercial values in the many, many billions of dollars. And I'm talking about now about private royalties, the Hancock royalty, uh, the Bass Strait Oil royalty, all multi, multi billion dollar assets. Um, there are huge legal uncertainties about their character, their legal character. Uh, and that is um, not just inconvenient, it's damaging to the efficiency of the legal regimes under which the exploitation occurs because it adds to risk and ultimately the asset pays the cost of that risk. So the owners of the resources pay the price of the legal uncertainty uh, arising in those arrangements. So my conclusion, and um, they should, I expect, come as no surprise. Um, 
Firstly, power sharing is a design feature of the Australian Constitution and has a profound impact on the management of natural resources. Um, secondly, predominance of statute over common law and the management of natural resources is now firmly established. Thirdly, the abrogation, the abrogation of prerogatives how to manage resources uh, uh, is likewise established. Fourthly, native title is recognized and largely secure, but this issue of executive extinguishment is a worry. Fifthly, the constitutional significance of state and territory proprietorship of onshore resources um, is legally established, but uh, not always um, reflected in political practice, such as over horizontal fiscal equalization. And finally, the failure to resolve critical legal issues relating to statutory topics and government agreements diminishes capacity for risk management, thereby detracting from economic efficiency in the management of those natural resources. Thank you, and apologies for the undue rate. Michael, and I think from the breadth of that scholarship, it's important, not only historically in terms of the foundations of Australia, but its current relevance. And I'd now like to ask the Dean of Melbourne Law School, Matthew Harding, to give a vote of thanks. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Lee. Um, thanks for your uh, leadership of CREA and for organising the lecture. We'll be in this room a week from now to say more on all of that, but thank you. Um, so, uh, colleagues, friends, um, in 1993, I think it was, as an undergraduate student in this university, I was enrolled in constitutional and administrative law, and the course was taught by Cheryl Saunders, and it was memorable for many reasons, but I do remember during the course of the year, uh, Michael came and gave a set of lectures. I think it was on the topic of the judiciary, could be wrong. Um, and uh, although I have dim memory of 1993, uh, I do remember some things about those lectures. One was that they took place at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, you're welcome. Uh, but then uh, I also remember uh, the very deep and broad learning that those lectures reflected about uh, our country's history, our system of government, our laws, our social and political economic life. Um, and I remember also the clarity of thought that um, lay behind those lectures. Uh, and uh, clearly that's all on display today. Michael, thank you so much. Um, that's the sort of lecture that can only be given by someone who has been at the top of their field for a very long period of time. And we're, we're really all privileged to have heard it. Uh, and especially thank you for uh, being here and delivering it on a day of great personal sorrow for you. Um, so, colleagues, friends, join me in welcoming uh, in thanking Michael for the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if we could open it up for questions, and that includes people online, uh, just a welcome to those people online. And if you'd like to pop something, uh, Debbie, it's in the chat there, or is it, because uh, this is a webinar, can I pop it in the in the chat, please? Debbie will monitor that for us. So. Well, I'm, yeah. Michael, thank you so much uh, for that very comprehensive revisiting of all of those themes. And uh, uh, you did touch on some of the current challenges, and I, I thought I might open um, out that question. So currently at the moment in Australia and, and globally, we're engaged in a, in a very fast energy transition process that's going to reopen a lot of our questions around how we use land and resources. I was interested in your reflections from that history of all of the aspects um, how well that structure serves us for that future challenge, um, where the, the strengths might lie and where some of the gaps are in, in your view. 
Thanks, Jackie. And um, well, climate change provides the case study really of the point you're making. Now, equipped are we as a country to cope with such a pervasive issue? Um, my short answer to your question, and of course, there could be a much longer discussion of it, is that the structure is pretty good, but it's not working as well as it can and should. Uh, let me just take, you know, allocation of power within our federal system of government. Um, we went through an era, I think, when uh, it was either assumed or hoped or both that the Commonwealth might fix everything that represented a problem in our lives. And that was very much linked to the rise of the environmental movement uh, in Australia. And you'd see it in the 70s, 80s, the two cases I mentioned, and, and beyond. Well, I think we're now at the point where it's very important to realise that the Commonwealth simply cannot, and indeed should not, take on that responsibility. That power is shared, it's deliberately shared, it's, the sharing mechanism is quite, it's very important in practice and it's quite unusual. Um, and uh, it requires um, mutual respect between levels of government, recognition of their proper roles in the constitutional scheme of things and recognition of the fact that all must be involved in their proper roles. I mean, just take um, solar. I mean, that requires land. Uh, wind farm, maybe Commonwealth Cannon is planning to deal with those as it should offshore. But onshore, what about electricity transmission lines? I mean, uh, there's no way that the Commonwealth can unilaterally resolve, and nor should it try to unilaterally resolve. Now, I mean, I'm already giving a long answer to what I promised would be short. But again, let me just make a bold assertion and not take the time to build it up. If you look at the uh, electricity market, the national electricity market in Australia, it's a very elaborate, extremely probably over complex system. Uh, but it tries to, and sadly, not entirely successfully, um, recognize the necessary roles of different levels of government in a scheme that is truly national. A, a national scheme involves all levels of government. A national scheme, this is a, another way of talking about the Commonwealth, a national scheme involves the collective. Each and each needs to better understand and respect the role of the other. Do we have a, 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 any queries in the chat? Okay. If I can then perhaps take the chair's prerogative and just follow on from Jackie's point, and this was something that was debated. Um, Jackie and I were part of a renamed Australian ex experts in environmental appeal group. And these were debates uh, that were there uh, as to what would be the ideal governance um, structure. And there were debates that uh, you have um, emphasized, Michael, around whether um, you know, there should be centralization at the Commonwealth level. And I know having co-taught with Jackie over many years, we have you know, opened up to our students these questions about you know, whether centralization in and of itself is a virtue, uh, notwithstanding that trajectory of cases that have really established environmental uh, law here in Australia, such as Tasmanian dams. But um, I can point to another example where land is very important, and that's water. And I think it's appropriate on a day where we, we recognize um, you know, the passing of Sandy, of, his contribution, and you may want to also add, add a few words here. The move to centralise without perhaps thinking about that federal structure is very apparent in the issues that we have in the Murray-Darling Basin around water. And the question about whether you can independently manage water and have water markets, irrespective of management of land, 
in the way in which um, the uh, Water Act was put in place. I think with, um, without the necessary thought perhaps of operating effectively within a federal structure goes to the very points that you have raised today. So I'd just uh, perhaps like to offer not really so much a, um, a question, but a comment on that. Uh, yes, yeah, can I just say I agree that that's a spectacular example and uh, something that's been with us since prior to Federation yeah. and took up so much time of the founders in efforts to find a solution. Um, and here we are yes, still <laughs> uh, struggling. Now, that's perhaps an acknowledgement of how difficult these things can be, but Acknowledging difficulty does not lead to the conclusion that they're unfixable, and it doesn't lead to the difficulty that some national level of government can just sweep in and fix everything. We have now too much experience to the contrary. We should um, note that as valuable experience of the past and um, try more sophisticated approaches. And I think. Uh, <clears throat> issues such as those will, will continue to resonate unless, you know, the, the clear sightedness on some of the, the issues around federalism, rather than seeing it as perhaps an anachronistic um, <laughs> uh, limit uh, that we should actually you know, be moving forward. And, and I think that, you know, the solar panels is the, the exact example around the energy tra transition and the role that Victoria has played um, uh, its leadership on things. Uh, yeah, speaks to that as well. Um, did anyone else? Um, yeah, yeah, Cheryl, would you like to come in? Yeah, I knew if everybody would, would, would uh, give me the book. <laughs> yeah, that was great, it was really interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you about Johnson and Kent. Yeah, uh, I was really interested in <laughs> attracted by what you said about Johnson and Kent, but I'd never really thought about it in that way. But I could see how we get there, you know, after the, the, the historical excursions into uh, the way in which state legislative power was built up in that way. So what, but, uh, but it's a long time since I've looked at Johnson and Kent. So what, what's the argument for the upcoming Johnson and Kent that um, the legislation didn't fully extinguish the prerogative or that the position about statute at the state level just didn't translate to the Commonwealth level and operate in the Commonwealth ter ter territory? Um, it's hard to answer that question. It doesn't emerge very clearly what the argument was. In, in other words, I think if Johnson and Kent were to return to the courts today, it would be approached in a completely different yeah. way to what it was. In many senses, uh, the argument strikes me, uh, as it was made at the time, as highly simplistic. and. Uh, it really reflected some of the approaches that the Commonwealth tried unsuccessfully in Pape, then Williams number one, and then ultimately in Williams number two. Namely, the Commonwealth is a person. Uh, you are a person. You can build, subject to planning laws, um, a shed on your property. The Commonwealth can build a telecommunications tower on its property. And if anyone's in doubt about that, the uh, sufficient response from Chief Justice Barwick, who really wrote one uh, uh, judgment that he was known for assertive judgments on various matters, and this falls into that category, he just said, it's a property. Well, of course, after Williams number two, that's the nonsense uh, now. It, it might, it, to be fair, perhaps it wasn't seen as a nonsense then, it's good enough to win the case. Um, but there was no reason basis. There was no proper historical analysis. The question of whether, because you know the ACT was carved out of New South Wales, the problem in respect to that land had already gone way back in 1842 with the United Kingdom legislation and if it had gone then, how was it somehow resuscitated? Not even considered. So I think in the paper that I didn't read, um, to me it looks like a relic of a bygone era. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you. I, I think, um, Jackie, if you don't mind, uh, we might um, ask that you take um, that point up with Michael, because I think we, we're sitting already at 110, Debbie. So uh, I, unless there's any burning question in the chat, I might um, finish off there and, and once again ask people both online. Hi, everyone, everyone in Zoom land and here in the room to give a final thank you for this wonderful annual lecture. And uh, for people who are um, coming with us to the lunch, a, a reminder that starts at one, uh, well, like in five minutes, <laughs> but, but the dinner actually, at the lunch. <laughs> it's hard to do, hard to do an annual dinner thing from lunch. All right, so thank you once again. <laughs>